Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's clip is with Nashville recording engineer Ernie Winfrey. My name is Ernie Winfrey. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. I started doing work with Buddy Killen on his master sessions. Uh, subsequently worked with Buddy for the next uh, oh, 15 to 18 years in the studio. Uh, in 1971, he bought uh, he and Kelso Hurston, Bobby Goldsboro, and Bob Montgomery bought Sound Shop Studios and asked me if I would come uh, come to Sound Shop uh, to run the studio for them. So I subsequently did uh, all of Joe Tuxie's albums that Buddy Killen produced. I uh, Probably the most memorable was uh, Paul McCartney in 1974. Paul had come to town as a uh, uh, primarily to rehearse for the their first Wings tour in America. Uh, Linda McCartney's uh, father happened to also be um, Buddy Killen's attorney in New York. He was he was a very well known attorney back then, music business attorney. He contacted Buddy, asked if there was some place that Paul and Linda could come with their, with their band and rehearse. Uh, Buddy went through <laughs> talking to a lot of people, trying to rent property, uh, and, and it, was, it was not looking good. Uh, he ended up talking to Curly Putman, uh, who uh, wrote Green Green Grass of Home, among other things. Uh, and Curly agreed to take a paid vacation in the tropics while Paul McCartney rented his house and, and grounds. Um, they were here about two weeks before Buddy actually brought Paul into the studio. Uh, in the meantime, Paul had been around uh, having dinner with Chad Atkins and meeting uh, all the musical people that he admired over the years. After Paul and Linda had been here about uh, two weeks, and of course, uh, there were big deals in the newspaper about uh, sightings all over town at Opryland and, and downtown and everything. Uh, Buddy, of course, owned the Sound Shop studio, and I'm sure that, that he probably uh, dropped several subtle hints to them that they really needed to come by and see his studio. And um, so Buddy and I were, were here one afternoon working on, on an artist named Paul Kelly, a rhythm and blues artist that Buddy produced. Paul and Linda walked in uh, unannounced and, and with no fanfare and, and waved at Buddy. They waved at Buddy and, and sat down in front of the old console that we had. Uh, the room then looked quite different than it does now. Um, Buddy and I finished doing uh, our overdubs or whatever we were in the process of doing and when it finished then they, they stood up Buddy introduced me to Paul and Linda, and um, they were very nice and gracious and, and friendly. And uh, they complimented Buddy on the studio and said that they really, really thought it was nice. Um, so at some point, Paul and, and Buddy got together and they blocked out about two weeks of time in the studio. Uh, Paul had not re originally come to town with the, with the idea of recording here. As a matter of fact, I think legally he wasn't supposed to. Uh, he only had a, a, a visitor's visa. He did not have a work visa to work here. Consequently, any, any of the things that we recorded here 
that were released later, neither uh, neither I nor the studio was able to get credit on it until many, many years later. Then some of the credits started showing up. Uh, uh, there were several things that were released uh, by Paul in, in collections, like number one records and that sort of thing. And... Um, and Junior's Farm always showed up in those collections, so my name was, my name and Sound Shop was always associated with that. So, uh, uh, but on the initial releases, uh, the album credits showed Jeff uh, Emmerich as the engineer on those those. And in essence, he was he finished he finished up what we had started here. But uh, but I was the one that actually recorded the sessions. They came in and um, laid down a couple of tracks. I think uh, Send Me the Pillow was the first track that they recorded. In the meantime, Paul had uh, tracks that they had recorded in Europe and, and in England that he wanted to, kind of wanted to uh, do overdubs on and, and finish up and take back with them with the possibility of putting them on an album. They had those sent over express. I mean, it didn't take more than a day or two for them to get here. So we overdubbed on those tracks. Then uh, the second week, we actually recorded uh, one of Paul's father's song called Walking Through the Park with Eloise. Paul enlisted uh, Chet Atkins and uh, Floyd Kramer on piano work on that we had a Dixieland horn section put together for that uh, that was that was a lot of fun to do Paul um, had gone somewhere in the country to an antique store and had bought an old washboard and and he put thimbles on his fingers and, and played the washboard on that uh, Sally G was actually the next to the last track that we cut uh, Paul wrote that about his his primarily or he was inspired by his visit to printers alley and um, uh, I, I, you can hear the obvious allusions to Printer's Alley when, uh, in, in the lyrics of the song. Uh, the last song we actually cut was Junior's Farm, which is Paul's tribute to uh, Curly for having uh, rented them his farm and, and providing a place for them to stay. Uh, and Paul's assistant at the time uh, asked me if I felt that they could, if we could record rock and roll here. And I said, I have no doubt that we can do that. So, uh, so we proceeded to cut that. Uh, and it was, it just had a great time doing it. And uh, then within, uh, actually within the next day, we had to make safety copies of, the, of all the 16 track tapes that we had recorded. How is Paul to work with? Paul was great to work with. He was very easygoing, um, very undemanding. Uh, although he knew what he wanted, when he when he came into the studio to record a song, he he had already formulated in his mind what he wanted it to sound like, and he even went so far as to uh, to sit down at the drums on a couple of things to show Jeff what he wanted him to play, or essentially. Uh, what he wanted him to play, and uh, and he was very much in control of the sessions. He always played bass as we laid the tracks down. Quite often, he would sing uh, the lead vocal as we as uh, as we recorded the tracks. Sometimes we would go back and re-record it. Other times well, we uh, we kept the vocal that he recorded. And I, I have since then uh, taken mixes that I did and compared them to the final mixes that Jeff Emmerich did in England. And they sound to me like they used exactly the same vocal. I don't, I don't think they ever, uh, ever redid the vocal on the thing. 
Uh, do you remember what kind of bass he was playing in the studio? Was it a Rickenbacker or was it the old? Uh, he he played the old Hoffman. He played two two basses. He he had had uh, played the uh, Hoffner, and he also had a white uh, hollow body Rickenbacker on several of the of the songs that he uh, ran direct directly into the console. Now on some things he also he did use an amplifier for effect and uh, uh, to, to achieve a certain type of tone, of an amplified, uh, distorted type of thing. When Paul's assistant asked me if, if I thought that we could record, you know, rock and roll here in Nashville, I, I said, sure, without any, you know, doubt at all. I mean, that, that's what I was waiting for them to say, really, you know, let's, let's rock and roll a little bit. Did Nashville musicians play on this album or play on these songs? We had, uh, actually there were quite a few uh, Nashville pickers uh, that played. Of course, uh, uh, Chad Atkins and, and Floyd Kramer played on that, the song that Paul's father wrote. Uh, Bobby Thompson played uh, guitar and banjo on, on uh, some of the things. Um, we had Lloyd Green played steel steel guitar on, on uh, a couple of the things. Buddy Emmons played steel on one song. There were twin sisters named the Kate sisters that played fiddle, twin fiddles on, um, uh, on one of the songs. And um, Vasha Clements and Johnny Gimble played f twin fiddles on, uh, on Sally G. And uh, let me think, oh, we had a, a, a Dixieland horn section with Billy Pewitt, um, Dennis Good, George Tidwell, there were a lot of a lot of guys that came and sat in. So, were there, unlike on Junior's Farm, for instance, was there Nashville musicians other than Wings playing on that particular no. track? That was all, no. that was all Wings. That was all Wings. Yeah, Paul had been kind of playing around with Denny Lane, uh, who was a guitar player and had worked with a group called the Moody Blues. Uh, and they had had a big hit uh, on a record called Go Now. Uh, at any rate, uh, they came here with, uh, with Denny, uh, a guy named Jimmy McCulloch on guitar, uh, a guy named Jeff Britton on drums. They were, they were for the most part very cooperative. The, if if we had any problems at all, it was uh, with the, the lead guitar player Jimmy McCulloch. Uh, he had been with a group called Stone the Crows and and some other English groups before McCartney picked him up. And I, I I'll start by saying he was a great rock and roll player. I mean he was really really good on on rock and roll guitar. He was pretty friendly in the studio, but it, there seemed to always be a chip on his shoulder. Uh, there was there was a, one night um, that they happened not to be recording, and I was working with Buddy in the studio doing some remixing. At that time, well, there still is a slight angle. The studio glass is angled to deflect sound, of course, so it doesn't bounce right back into your face. Um, Jimmy had come in the studio and it was obviously he had been, been indulging in a few drinks. He sat down in front of the console and, and Buddy and I were working and he, he just kept kind of mouthing off. He wasn't talking to anyone in particular, just, ah, well, uh, yeah, uh. and next thing we knew, we see a Coke bottle, empty Coke bottle fly at the glass and clunk, hit it. And, and fortunately, I guess because the glass was at an angle, it deflected it downward to the floor. And and <laughs> Buddy and I just both froze. I said, oh gosh, man, what is going on? So Buddy went around and he got Jimmy by the arm and, and said, Jimmy, I think it's time to go. And Jimmy was kind of, oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. 
Buddy walked him up to the front door, and, and Jimmy later got busted by the cops that night. Uh, I don't I don't know if that story's ever been told yet or not, but uh, uh, I mean, Buddy called out all the all the top guns to go down to night court, and and the judge told Jimmy he said he said you have some very powerful friends in Nashville. He said I want I'm going to let you go. He said I don't want to ever see your face in Nashville again. And of course he that was that was you know that the night that they left to go the next day so so he was off the hook on that but um, so Jimmy went on the on the first wings tour with them as long as as long as that lasted Paul had bought a motorcycle here in the meantime so he had to rent a trailer to attach to his rental car to pull the the, the motorcycle to New York and they left the next the next morning they drove to New York? They drove to New York, yeah. Apparently that was not unusual for them to just get out and drive around, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they drove to New York. Uh, we had a little kid that worked here as an assistant that uh, actually carried their the master tapes after we had completed making the, uh, the safety copies to carry the master tapes out, met them uh, at the interstate in Lebanon, and they they left from there and went to uh, went through Knoxville and up. From what I understand, they went up the the Blue Ridge Trail and on up to New York from there.